evening and good morning. Uh, this is again your host, Mike Espina. Welcome to Math Agility Live. This is our new platform where students can send in their math homework problems to our social media channels, and we will answer them via Facebook Live every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. PST. Uh, that's Wednesday and Friday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Manila time. And tonight, uh, I will be solving the problems given at the second elimination round of MAC 2021. So elimination round two, I mean. So we before we proceed, let me congratulate the following individuals. So uh, the actually our uh, successful semi-finalist for elimination round two is Mr. Chris Norman Algo. Okay, let me share to you my screen. Hold on. Just give me a second. So I can post uh, in my screen the list of winners. So, so here are the successful uh, uh, semifinalists. That's Chris Norman Algo, Renis Lim, IC Lance Bautista, Kenneth Vince Reno, Shalomia Balilia, Jeric Maliari, Joshua Gallo, and J. Kim Cleopas Pucaba. So congratulations. You already um, included in the semifinal round. You don't have, if you uh, actually um, registered for elimination round three and four, you don't need to, uh, to participate in that because you're already in for the semifinal round. And so we can start now. Our let me share to you uh, the solution for elimination round two. Just give me a second. Okay, so this is uh, easy problem number one. Let me again allow my virtual board to annotate. Okay, so for problem number one, so the box contains uh, five green pens, eight red pens, and nine blue pens. You draw four pens out at the random without replacement. What is the probability that none of the pens are green? So uh, there are two ways to compute this. One is that uh, we can use this formula. So what I made here is for the first method, I simply put the combination of five and zero to all the terms and then do the combinations of, since we are grow, drawing four pens, uh, either from red or nine blue. So the first term includes zero green pen. So if you see this, right? And then this is two uh, red and two blue pen. So the next would be three red pen, one blue pen. Three red pens and one blue pen. And then one blue pen, uh, one red pen and three blue pens. And then none red pen, of course, still green is zero. And for four blue pens. And then this time it's four red pens and non-blue pens and also no green pens. And if you compute that, that will result into 0.3254 or 32.54%. And the fastest way to do it is, uh, if you can see here, um, just subtract, let me erase. So just subtract uh, five, from the total, which is 22 pens, right? Because we have five green pens and you don't want it. So just subtract uh, five from 22. So we get 17, which is this. So if you look at the, the solution, the combination will now be C is 17. 
taken for at the time. And then we divide it by the total number of pens, which is 22 by 4. Okay, so we're drawing four pens. So, so the, uh, the answer would be, of course, the same at 32.54% or 0 0.3254. Okay, if you have any questions, you can write down in the comment section. And I will answer it as soon as I finish this live um, session. Okay, so let's go to easy, uh, easy problem number two. So let me move this. So if you got the first question, you have a full uh, one point for that. And then, so this one is uh, perform the operation below and express the final result into rectangular form should be exact and no decimals allowed. So we have 20, 20 n plus the summation of this square root of three minus i to the n plus n from n 2020 to 2022. So most of the students would also evaluate the limit to the first term, which is 2020 n. Uh, if you do that, that would be uh, not the correct procedure. So first, uh, let's try to expand the square root of 3 minus, one, minus i to the n using the Mobs theorem. So this is actually uh, would result to r to the n cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. So to be able to solve for r, um, we have to get the square root of x squared plus y squared. In this case, our x would be square root of 3 and negative 1 for uh for is that one yeah for negative one for square root for the other one square root of negative one and plug it in in the formula we have uh so square root of negative one so three would be negative one over square root of three So y is negative one, right? And we got tangent of theta over uh, is equal to negative one over square root of three. So we get negative 30 degrees. So the other way of the, the uh, when we turn the, the angle into positive, so counterclockwise, it would give us 330 degrees, right? So we have this, so going clock counterclockwise so this is your negative 30 here right 30 degrees so this would mean this is 333 degrees positive right so so hence we have 2 to the n quantity of cosine cis n 330 degrees right so the next step is to evaluate the summation so we're done with uh, getting the values for r and the theta. Now we're going to evaluate the summation from our limit from 2020 to 2022. So we just simply uh, expand this, substitute n for the first term. So that will be 2 to the 2020 cosine 2 2020 times 330 degrees plus i sine of 220 times 330 degrees plus 2020. And then we need to repeat that for the values of 2021 and 2022, which is, you can see on the second line, this line and the last line here. And then we'll try to, um, to evaluate the angles of cosine to 2020, 330 degrees. So that would give us negative one half, right? Because it's positive. And then for a sine, um, cosine, and then for a sine of 330 degrees, that is square root of three over two. If you still remember your unit circle, right? So that would fall on square root of three over two, 330 degrees. And 
So, and then for 2021, so this time cos sine would be negative square to 3 over 2 because there's another uh, 330, right? So, it would fall on the other side at, I think, 150, yeah, 150 degrees. And, I don't know, not 150, sorry. Should be at 210 degrees. So, at, at 210 degrees, we have square to 3 over 2 for cosine of 221 times 330 degrees. And then, for uh, sine of 2021 um, times 330. So again, that will fall to 210 degrees. So that would be negative one half. So if you see this part here, right? It's negative one half. And then the last part, the last term would be at 2022. So 2022 would fall at exactly at 180 degrees of course that's counterclockwise so sine would be negative on that part so we got a negative one here and a zero at its imaginary part right because the sine of 180 degrees would be zero okay so uh, once we're done with this let's add all the constants so 220 plus 221 plus 2022 would be 6063 here at the end. And then let's factor out 220. So I factored it out. So, and then we can combine all the imaginary with the I and all the uh, numerical values here. So simplifying this would give us the first part, which is negative nine minus two square root of three over two. And then on the imaginary part would give us negative two plus square root of three divided by two. Of course, remember we had this constant here at the end and then we have this factor of 220, 20 at the front of our expression. So rearranging them so we can combine the, con the 663 to the first part of our equation. So I then distributed 220 again to both of the terms. So you can see 220 here in the first term and then the imaginary part will also have two to the 20, right? Two to the 20, 20, I mean. So now uh, we're done with the summation part. So we have evaluated this part. Now we're gonna add the first term, which is 2020 n, right? So this means 2020 n plus the answer on our last um, expression. So this means we just need to include 2020n to the uh, real part of our uh, complex number. So 2020n plus, plus this and 663 plus i, and then 2 to the 20, 2020 uh, quantity negative two plus square root of three divided by two. So this would be your final answer. Maybe there are some variation. I think I saw some answers like that. So I would still give one point for that. Okay, so if you have any questions, please uh, write down, write it down on our comment section. Let me see. Okay, so let's move to question number three. Okay, so question E3 says, from the peak of El Capitan Mountain in California, um, Seneca, hold on. So Seneca, <laughs> let me move this, okay, yeah. Okay, Seneca sees uh, the two cities, Forestra and El Portal in the plain. The lines of vision directed to these points include the angle alpha, 
And then the inclination of the first line of vision to a horizontal plane is alpha. That of the second line, beta. It is known that the points in Foresta, Foresta and El Portal are on the same level and that the distance between them is C. So express the elevation X of the peak above the common level in Foresta and El Portal in terms of the angles alpha, beta, and gamma, and the distance between them is C. So the first requirement is to draw this properly or correctly. So you can see here that we have the mountain and that height is X as given. And then we have two points, which is the city of Poresta and El Portal. If this is the ground, so this is a three dimension drawing. So the ground would be this triangle with the um, dotted lines or the broken lines here. And then the alpha is the angle of elevation from the ground if you're looking at Foresta, going to the pick up or the top of the mountain and then El Portal, it's beta. If you're looking to the top of the mountain from El Portal and it says the distance between two cities is C. And if you're in the top of the, on the top of the mountain, um, the included angle will be gamma. So if you're looking at the top, uh, top view of this, so this would be your gamma here, top view. So this is Foresta and this is El Portal. Okay. And then also given is the distance of the peak to Foresta is A. So this is, this is that value here. And then the distance of the peak of the mountain to, B, to El Portal is B. So that's the value of that. So we can derive the first and second equation from sine theta, since we have the angle and we have the hypotenuse and also the given uh, opposite side, which is X, right? The peak of the mountain. So the first equation we can get is sine alpha X over A, right? So if you remember your Sokotoa sine would be opposite over hypotenuse, right? So opposite is X and your hypotenuse at Foresta is A. Now we can derive uh, sine beta. So again, Sokatoa. So sine is opposite. So opposite is X, which is this. And hypotenuse at L portal is B. So we got the value of B here. So we have now two equation. And then using cosine law, if we look at the top view of the of this. Uh, we have okay. Let me draw it again here. So this is alpha. This is C. This is A, and this is B. And this side here. So this is city of Foresta, and this would be El Portal, right? So if you, if you have this uh, given values for a triangle, we can use the cosine law. So it means C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine of gamma, right? Now we can um, rearrange equation 1 and 2 in terms of A and B, which is this. So we we um, transform uh, equation one in terms of alpha and x. So A equals x over sine alpha. And the same method we use, we transform equation two to, in terms of x and beta to equation B equals to x over sine beta. So now let's substitute this uh, values of A and B to equation three. Let me clear my, okay. So we substitute A and B to our equation three, which is our cosine law, right? This part here. So just substitute X over sine alpha squared, and then X over sine beta squared minus two times quantity of X sine alpha, and then X sine beta times cosine gamma. So, and then just simplify this, we would get 
uh, this line of uh, expression. So c squared equals x squared over sine squared alpha plus x squared sine squared of beta minus 2 x squared over sine alpha sine beta times cosine gamma. So to eliminate uh, sine alpha squared and sine beta squared, so we will multiply all both sides of the equation by this factor, right? Sine alpha squared and sine beta squared. So our left-hand side of our equation would get that factor, which is c squared, sine alpha squared, sine gamma squared, uh, sine squared beta, and then equals, of course, sine alpha squared will cancel out. So what is left is sine squared beta on the first term. And then on the second term, um, we will have, What's this okay? Uh, it cancelled out sine squared alpha, so what is left is uh, I mean sine squared beta, so what is left is sine squared alpha on the second term. So we have x squared sine alpha here on the second term, and then uh, it cancel out one sine, al sine alpha and sine beta as well, and we left with sine alpha, sine beta, cos sine gamma, and then the 2x squared. So manipulating this, we will have uh, the final equation required, x in terms of um, alpha, beta, and gamma, which is x squared equals c squared, sine alpha squared, sine squared, sine squared alpha, sine squared beta, divided by sine squared beta, the sine squared alpha minus 2 sine alpha sine beta cosine gamma. So this would be the final answer for uh, question number three. So if you got this, you get one full point. And then for question number four. Okay, if you have any question for uh, question number three, you can write it down at the comment section and I will try to answer them later. Okay. Okay, so let's move to uh, question number four. So again, this is um, a trigonometric uh, problem. So using identities, trigonometric identities. So the question is, Jensen wanted to prove the following identity based on the triangle with angles alpha, beta, and gamma. So we have already a hint, it's a triangle. So Show that the identity one result in identity two and identity two results in identity three. So alpha, beta, and gamma are part of a triangle, right? So that's a given. So the required is proof of the first result, which is identity one result into identity two. And then the second uh, requirement is to prove the second result, which is identity two that result into identity three. So Given that the angles are from a triangle, so we can form the first equation as alpha plus beta plus gamma is, is equal to pi, right? Because pi is actually equal to 180 degrees. And if you have a triangle, the sum of all of this, alpha, beta, and gamma would be 180 degrees, right? So we can transform this equation to this form, which is equation number four here. So phi, pi minus two alpha plus quantity pi minus two beta plus um, pi minus two gamma is equal to pi. So if you try to um, manipulate this, that would be equal to pi. All of them will be equal to pi. Okay. So that's equation four. And then if we substitute these angles in equation one, so our equation one is this, right? So let's start with that. Let's start by substituting the equation. So we have sine alpha plus sine beta plus sine gamma 
is equal to 4 cosine alpha over 2 times cosine beta over 2 times cosine gamma over 2. So now let's substitute phi to alpha for alpha. So that's what we did for the first term. And then instead of beta, we use sine, uh, we use phi minus 2 beta, which we use in the second term here. And then on the third term, instead of gamma, we use pi minus 2 gamma here, right? And same thing on the right-hand side, instead of alpha, we use pi minus 2 alpha. And for beta, that's pi minus 2 beta. And for gamma, that's pi minus 2 gamma. So if we use the identity sine A minus B, so that is equivalent to sine A cosine B minus cosine A sine B. So we can expand the above equation to the following. If we expand this, each of the terms of sine, so that would result to the left-hand side for this, right? By just following this trigonometric identity. So uh, what do you call this? Difference of angles, right? Difference angle formula. Second up. Yep. Difference formula identity. And then same. And then we um, actually distribute the two on the right hand side of the equation. So this will become pi over 2 minus alpha cosine phi over 2 minus beta, cosine phi over 2 minus gamma. So again, we have the different I, difference, some angle difference for cosine. So if we expand that, oh, this is actually equivalent to sine, right? If you have phi over 2 minus alpha or any angle, that would be equivalent to the sine of that angle. If you have a cosine as your function, that would be equivalent to sine. So if we evaluate sine phi, so that's zero here, cosine phi, that's negative, and then the sine to alpha would remain. Again, on the third term, sine alpha is zero, which is this, and then cos minus cosine alpha, so that's minus negative one. And then sine alpha here on this part, that would be zero, which is this. And then negative cosine alpha, so minus negative 1 of sine 2 gamma. And then on the right-hand side, we explain that cosine alpha, cosine of quantity alpha over uh, pi over 2 minus alpha would be equal to 4 sine of alpha here. Same thing with cosine pi over 2 minus beta, that would be sine beta. And cosine pi over 2 minus gamma, that would be equal to sine gamma. So um, simplifying this expression, we have sine to alpha, sine to beta, sine to gamma equals 4 sine alpha times sine beta, sine gamma. So we already have proven um, the first requirement. So let's go to the second requirement. So once again, let us use equation 4 in equation 2 and the identity sine A minus B, sine, which is equivalent to sine A cosine B minus cosine A sine B, right? So let's again substitute on equation 2, which is sine 2 alpha. So we already uh, expand. So instead of alpha, we use again our angle as pi minus 2 alpha, which is in the first term right here. But since this time we have 2 in front of the argument or in front of the angle, same thing with the beta. We uh, substitute my minus phi, pi minus 2 beta and then the 2 in front of the argument. And of course, for gamma, we, all have, the, we have the same as pi minus 2 gamma and then the 2 in front of the argument. Same thing on the right side. Let's, uh, we need to uh, 
change the angles to pi minus 2 alpha, pi minus 2 beta, and this one here at pi minus 2 gamma. So by simplifying this, uh, we would, and expanding them using the identity, the difference of angle identity, which is this one here, we would get negative sine for alpha minus 4 sine 4 beta minus 4 sine gamma equals 4 sine 2 theta 2 alpha sine 2 beta and sine of 2 gamma. So if we uh, divide the left hand side equation by negative 1, so this will turn out all to positive and the right hand side of the equation will be negative. So we have proven that equation 2 leads to equation 3 here, right? So that's already proven. So if you have any questions, again, you can write down in our comment section below. Okay. So let's move to question number five. So, so the question reads, the scientist Haley Smith of Agility Labs in San Francisco, California, found that the behavior of a new virus in infecting humans follow this polynomial model. So X plus x to the 11, plus x to the 41st, plus x to the 60, plus x to the 99. And she also discovered that the remainder of this model when the divisor negative x plus x cubed is the amount of a new medication that should be taken by a patient infected by the new virus. So that's the medication model. What is the remainder of this polynomial model? So this is a algebra polynomial question. So we know that the degree of the remainder is always one degree less from the degree of the divisor. So our divisor is has degree three, right? Which is negative x plus x cubed. So that's degree three. The highest exponent is three of the polynomial x or the variable x. Hence our remainder will have second degree, right? in this form. So our x would be a. So that's what we're going to look for plus bx. So we're going to look for b and cx squared, right? So this is a second degree polynomial. So that's our remainder. So and then so we set up that as equation one or name it as equation one. So setting up the quotient qx and the remainder our, our x for our polynomial we have. So since this is our polynomial, so our quotient multiplied by our divisor plus remainder would equal to our polynomial, right? It's like if we try to divide 7 by 2, right? And so we get 3, 3 divided by 2, 6, and the remainder is 1. This is our quotient. This is our divisor. So our, our 7 would be equal to quotient multiplied by the divisor, right? Plus remainder. So what is what is our uh, what is our quotient? So we say it's 3, right? And then the divisor is 2. And plus one. So that would be equal to seven. So that's what we did here. In this line here, highlighted. So let me highlight that. This part here, right? So that yellow highlight there. So we have qx minus quantity minus x plus x cubed plus the remainder of a plus bx plus cx squared, right? Okay, so let's clear that. So let's move to the next step. So the roots of the divisor negative x plus x cubed are, so let's factor out 
x from negative x plus x cubed. So we would have x, x plus 1, and x minus 1 equals 0. So the roots of our divisor would be x equals negative 1, 0, and 1, right? So since we have a degree 3, so our roots would have also be 3. So if we let x equals negative 1, 0, and 1, we have the following three equations. So when x is negative 1, let's substitute that in our equation here. So that is negative 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 equals qx, 1 minus 1 plus a minus b plus c, right? Because negative 1 and then if we simplify that, that would be negative 4 equals a minus b plus c. That's equation 2 here. Okay. So now let's uh, move to when x is 0. So substitute that. 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, right? Because all of this would give us 0. And then qx minus 0 plus 0. So 0 by 0 times 0 would be 0 plus the remainder a minus b times 0 plus c times 0. So a equation 3 would be a equals 0 here. Now let's substitute when x equals 1. So that would be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So that would be equal to 5. And then qx times negative 1 plus 1, that would be 0. So qx would be eliminated. And then we have a plus b plus c. So we have equation 4. So if we let if we substitute equation 3 when a is 0 to equation 2, so we will get equation 5, which is c equals b minus 4 here. And in equation 4, so 5 equal substitute c, right? This value of c to equation 4. So we will have 5 equals 0 plus b plus b quantity b minus 4. So we will get b equals 4.5. So we have the value of a equals 0. We now have a value of b equals 4.5. 4 so let's substitute. And it says c is equal to b minus 4, right? In equation 5. So since b is 4.5 minus 4, so c is point zero point five. Therefore, the remainder or the model for the medication uh, according to the scientist Haley Smith is Rx equals 4.5x plus 0.5x squared. So that's the final answer here. So if you got this, you would get full one point here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's move to the average pro uh, problem. So we have again five problems here. And this time each would be two points. So I, um, I think in last year this question was uh, already asked in Mac 2020. So and I already, and again I ask it this year. I tweak it a little, change some parameters. So let's read the problem. So after the couple Luis and Lena settled in New York. Uh, Louis' parents gave them a piece of land as a gift. So the triangular piece of land ABC has a measurement of AB, which is 3,000 meters, <clears throat> BC equals 4,000 meters, and AC, which is 5,000 meters. The condition of the parents is that a minimum ratio of 30% of the piece of land, so 30% of the piece of land in relation to the area of the property left. So property left meaning uh, the whole area of the land minus that piece of land that they would given. So that's the property left, right? For the couple should be planted with apple and orange trees to generate income in the future. Okay, so the surveyor made a point D and E which are on the side of the lot of A, B, and A, C, respectively. So D would be at lot A, B, at the side of lot A, B. And point E will be landing on lot, on the side of lot A, C, okay? So it says here, 
AD is measured 2,500 meters. A is measured 2,000 meters. Louise and Lena consulted the surveyor. If the land was cut correctly according to the instruction of the parents, the surveyor confirmed their inquiry that it was cut according to the 30% ratio condition. So it should be minimum. It should not be below 30, but it can go higher, right? So that that's the condition of the parents. So compute the actual ratio of the land. So, uh, so it's required that we need to draw it. So that's important to be able to compute this. We should be able to draw uh, the figure correctly. So this would be the triangular lot. So AD has total of 3,000. So point D is in between AB, AB side AB. So a, given AD is 25, therefore DB would be 500, right? If this is total of 3,000. And then for AC, point E is located in that. And it was given that AE should be 2,000. Since the total of AC is 5,000, therefore EC would be 3,000, right? And then for BC, it's also given it's 4,000 meters, right? Okay. So... Okay, look at the ratio. If the ratio of the area of ADE, so ADE is this triangle above, uh, to ABC, which is the whole lot, right? So ADE, triangle ADE over triangle ABC. So we can use the similar, this ratio and proportion. So AD, AD over AB of the whole triangle, right? AB times AE, again, for the small triangle and divided by segment AC, which is the whole triangle or the whole lot. So that would be equivalent to 25 over 3,000 times 2,000 over 5,000, which we, when we simplify, that's one third, okay? Since we're looking for the ratio of the area of ADE, so ADE, the small triangle above, to the area of the quadrilateral DBCE, which is the lot left to the couple. So the lot left to a couple is a quadrilateral, which is D, D, B, C, and E, this part here, right? D, B, C, and E. So it's a quadrilateral. So we can deduce or we can find the area of this quadrilateral as, of course, the whole, right? The whole triangle minus the area of the small triangle ADE. That's the area of DBCE, right? To be able to get the ratio of the small triangle to the area of the property left, which is the area of the quadrilateral DBCE. So we can use this equation, right? So triangle ADE over the area of DBCE is equal to, of course, ADE. And since we have this equation here, DBCE, area of DBCE is equal to triangle ABC minus ADE. So that's the denominator here at the right-hand side of the equation. Now, if we divide the right side of the equation by ADE, so if we divide everything by ADE in the numerator and denominator, we will have, so dividing the numerator by ADE, so that's one, right? ADE divided by ADE is one. And then ABC divided by ADE, this part here. And then ADE divided by ADE, of course, it's one again here. So since we have the value ABC over ADE, that's the reciprocal of this, right? ADE over ABC, so reciprocal of one third is three. So we write it, we write it in this equation as three minus one. So three minus one is one half. So therefore, ADE over DBCE is fifty percent. So the condition of a minimum of thirty percent is met. So this is the answer. Okay. So if you refer to our previous. Uh, uh, problems last year, you will definitely get this. You will answer th this correctly.
Okay, so let's go to problem number two. Let me move this to the next page. Okay, so again, this problem was given last year. So I tweak a little on the given on some parameters here. So let's read the problem. So we have four small circles of radius A, which is ln cosine inverse of x inverse, are each tangent to two sides of the square. So we have a square, which is the blue one. This small circle is tangent to those sides, right? And externally tangent to a circle of radius B. So there's another circle inside tangent to the four small circles and its radius is one over sine cosine of E, the negative X. So the question is, what is the area of the square? So we're gonna look for the area of the blue square. So, so let's draw our square like this. If you can see, uh, if we connect the centers of the small circle that pass through the center of the orange circle, if you can see this green line, right? We have the figure below. So the broken line for the red square would be equivalent to D. So the side is D and I name the length of the blue square or the side of the square as y here, right? Okay, so from the, the square that we draw, C will be the diagonal. So off the diagonal would be this green line here. And it is equivalent to the diameter of the large circle. So diameter of the large circle and the two radii of the small circles, all right? So first radii here on the upper part and then at the lower part of the small circle. So we have two radii of the small circles. So therefore, so we need to add the diameter of the orange circle, which is two over sine cosine E negative X plus two ln of cosine of negative one X to the negative one, right? So since we have the value C and D are equal for the legs of the right triangle, we can use the Pythagorean theorem by solving D, right? So C squared is, of course, D squared. C squared is D squared plus D squared, right? Since they are equal, C squared equals to two D squared and D is equal to the square root of C squared over two. So C is, is, is uh, D is equal to C over square root of two and rationalizing this would give us C square root of two over two, okay? So let's substitute the value of uh, C that we got initially. So this is our C and we substitute here in D and then we distribute square root of two over two on those two terms inside our bracket. So we have square root of two here and square root of two here and the two cancels out, right? So looking back at the figure, we can derive the relationship for Y. So from side D, so this is Y, the side of the square D of the red square and the red die of the two circles. So R Y is actually the length D. If you look at the red um, with the broken line plus two A, right? So A, of course, from this point here, the corner of our red square would have all, an equivalent radius of this small circle here. Same here as well, right? On the lower, end of the square, we would have the radius of this small circle here, which are equal, right? A. So our Y would have the value of D, which already um, computed, plus 2A, the radius of the two circles. So substituting, we will get Y equals square root of two divided by sine of cosine of E to the negative X plus ln of cosine inverse x inverse quantity square root of two plus two, which is this one, right? Now, uh, the question is to get 
the area of the blue square, right? So since we know that this is y, the area would be y squared. So area is y squared. So we know what is y. So ex just expanding this uh, terms and you would get the area of the uh, blue square, which is this. So it's a bit long. So two quantity one over sine cosine of e to the negative x squared plus two square root of two sine of cosine of e to the negative x times ln of cosine inverse of cosine inverse x inverse or x to the negative one quantity square root of two plus two plus quantity of ln of cosine inverse x to the negative one quantity square root of two plus two squared square unit. So that's the area. If you got this question, you will get full, uh, the total score is two points, yeah, for average problem. So let's go to question number three. So if you have any questions on question, average question, Number two, please write it down at the comment section below, okay? Okay, so we're halfway. So we're now in average question number three. So uh, this is easy as long as you know how to manipulate four equations with four unknowns. This is not a problem for you to solve. So find the equation of a polynomial with three bumps that has the following points. So negative coordinate negative 6, 4, negative 3, 8, 1 and negative 24, and 2, and 2, negative 12, and 6 and negative 4. So we have already a clue that our equation or our polynomial or our model would have three bumps, right? So meaning our equation would have four degrees. So a polynomial with three bumps would have a fourth, will have a fourth degree equation. So our polynomial has the form y equals ax squared plus, hold on, what is this x squared? This should be four. So four, and then this should be three, bx cubed, right? Three, and then cx squared plus dx plus e, okay? So, and then what is, what we need to do next is just substitute all of this uh, coordinates here. So we start with negative six, four, substitute in this equation that we got, and we have equation one here. So we have one, two, three, four, five variables, right? E would be the constant of this polynomial. And then same thing with negative three and eight. So we would result into equation two here, which is um, eight equals eight one A. Again, A, B, C, D, and E, right? With the, the numerical coefficient. And then at one negative 24, uh, we will have equation three here. So it's, it's just plugging in these values to this equation here. And then, so we have equation four, and then let's use negative six and four to the equation. We get equation five here. Okay, so we have equation one, two, three, four, and five. So four unknowns, it can be solved by five equations. So what I used here, is a matrix solution. So um, all of the numerical coefficients of our polynomial would be lined up here. So the I wrote the first uh, equation. So 1, 2, 9, 6, the numerical coefficient, and then negative 2, 16, which is the second column, and then 36 would be the third column, negative 6, would be the fourth and the constant E, which is one here, right? And then you will do the same with equation two. So 81, negative 27 here, nine, negative three and one, right? 
Same thing with equation 3. So we got negative one, uh, positive 1. All, all of them are positive 1, right? On the third in equation number 3. And then equation 4 would be 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. And then for equation 5, that's 1, 2, 9, 6, 2, 16, 36, 6, and 1 here. And then we have a second matrix, which is A, B, C, D, and E. So the way to read this is 1296 times A, negative 216 times B, 36 times C, negative 6 times D, 1 times E. So if you're going to do that, you will revert it back to equation 1. And then the rest or the... The constants would be on the right-hand side of the matrix, which is 4. So in equation 1, that's 4 here, right? And then 8, negative 24, negative 12, and negative 4, right? So negative 4 at the bottom is equation 5. So we know the relation AX equals B. So we're trying to solve for X, right, here, which is this... Uh, matrix A, B, C, D, e, and E. So transposing A to the right-hand side, so that is A inverse B. So inverse of A, so this would require a matrix uh, solution. So I would not explain it here further. So this is equivalent to 1 over 30 over 240 times... Uh, what is inside our equation, which is this. And then multiplied by B, which is the R constants, right? 4, 8, negative 24, and 12. So manipulating uh, the right-hand side of this equation would give us A equals negative 1, 9. B equals 0. C equals 43 over 9. D is equal to negative 2.3 and E equals negative 2.8. So therefore, the polynomial is, so remember our polynomial is this, right? So we already solved for A, for B, for C, for D, and E here. So we just simply plugged it in there. So what? Negative 1, 9, X to the fourth. 0x to the third, 43 over 9x squared, negative 2 third x, and minus 28. So since we don't write the one with zero numerical coefficient, so our final answer for our polynomial is y equals negative 1 9 x to the fourth plus 43 over 9x squared minus 2 third x minus 28. So I think some of you didn't get this. So numerical coefficient is defined as these numbers in front of our variable, right? So 28 is a constant. That's not a numerical coefficient. So we just need to add negative 1, 9 plus 43 over 9 minus 2 thirds. So that's the total of 4, okay? Okay, if you have any question, you can write it down or on our comment section below. So let's go to question number four of the average problem. So again, this is given, oh no, this is a discrete mathematics question. So let's read the problem. So Kent is testing if his argument is valid. So if I study, then I will not fail statistics. If I don't play online games, then I will study, but I failed statistics therefore i must have played online games so we're going to test if ken's argument is valid so uh, it is required that we need to write the truth table that's one point and then we have to write our conclusion if it is valid or not valid based on our truth table so First things first, let's represent our argument by the variable that said. So let's say A, the variable A is I study. 
And then B is I failed statistics. And C as equals I play online games, okay? So this argument has a structure. So we just follow what is given above. So A implies not B. So I will not fail. So negative, that's negation of B. And then uh, the next uh, premise is if I don't play online, so that's negation of C, right? That implies A. Then I will study. So A, it's not a negation. And therefore, B, so I failed statistics. Therefore, I must have played online games, which is C. Okay, so since we have three uh, variables here, we would be able to form a two, to the, 2 to the third power, which is eight rows, right? So if we line up A, B, and C as our three rows, so we'll be able to write four through and four false for column A. And then for column B, we would write two true, two false, TT, and FF, right? And then for C, that's true false, true false, true false, true false, true false. And then the negation of B would be, so if it's true, then negation of B is false. And if it's false, then it would must be true if it's a negation of B. So just following that rule, so we'll be able to fill up the fourth column, which is negation of B. And then A conditional to negation of B. So uh, we know that this would only be false when A is true and negation of B is false. So we can see that row one and two satisfies that that um, rule so t f so look at the first row uh, first column first row which is t here and f so we said if first variable is true and the second variable is false by conditional uh, argument would be false right and also same thing with the second row it's uh, a is T and negation of B is false. So again, another false here at the second row. The rest are not following this rule. So we would get all through here, right? So if you notice T and T, again, same thing here, T and T, F and F, F and F, F and T, F and T. So all of them would give a value of true, right? Now on the neg negation of C column, so we just negate C. So if this is true, then it must be false here on this column. So F must be true here on negation of C. And we'll just fill up false, true, false, true, false, true for the column negation of C. And now for the last column, which is negation of C, conditional to A, right? So again, we will follow the same rule for conditional. It would only be false when uh, negation of C is true and A is false. So that would only happen at the last row. So the rest are already true here because look at Look at the last row. So negation of C is true and A is false. So that would give us false, right? All right. So based on the truth table, the premise is A conditional to the negation of B and then negation of C conditional to A and B are true simultaneously on the fifth line. So where is the fifth line? So I highlighted it in yellow. So a negation of B, uh, A conditional to negation of B is true. And then uh, negation of C implies A is also true here. And then B is also true. So 
on the fifth line of the table and C, which is the conclusion. So C is our conclusion is also true here. So therefore, the argument is valid. So if you look at uh, the fifth line, so our conclusion true for uh, A con implies negation of B, negation of C implies A and B are all true, right, on the fifth line. So therefore, the argument is valid, all right? So next is an integral of this form. So, okay, so let's, for question number five, evaluate the given integral. So mk equals integral of sine kx cosine k cosine to the kx divided by x dx from zero to infinity where k is a positive integer. So let's use the binomial theorem. So we know that e to the 2ix plus 1 raised to the k can be formed into a summation formula of, of a combination of kr, right? So this means combination of kr, e to the ri. 2rix times 1 to the kr. So from r0, this is our limit to k, right? And since 1 to the kr is still 1, so we don't need to write it here. So that simplifies our expression. And we know that kr is a combination, so that is equivalent to k factorial over r factorial, k minus r factorial. So this is our equation 1. So we can say that uh, we can use also Euler's identity. So e to the ix. So we already used this earlier, right, in the Mobs theorem. So e to the ix is cosine x minus sine x. And we have also this uh, relationship between exponential and cosine. Cosine x is e to the ix plus e to the negative ix over 2. So we can also expand this expression, right, in terms of this Euler's identity and this trigonometric identity here. So e to the kix quantity e to the ix plus e to the negative ix uh, raised to the k is equal to cosine kx plus sine kx. So for the e, chi, e to the kix, we use this Euler identity here. And then e i x plus e to the negative i x raised to the k. We use this trigonometric identity here. So which we form 2 to the k cosine k to the x. So now equating the imaginary part of e to the i x plus 1 to the k. So our imaginary part is this, right? Oops, sorry. The sine k x and the 2k to the cosine k x. So which is this. And from... Equation one, right? This is our, sorry, this is our equation one. The imaginary part of e to the rx or e to the rix when we expand it using Euler's identity is cosine 2rx minus sine 2rx. So equating this to that. And since we still have the summation part of, of r to the zero to k, so we just copied it and the combination of kr here. So if we try to start at r equals 1, evaluating r0, so I wrote it here somewhere. So r to the 0 is, is equal to 1. So you will not see it here because it's just equal to 1, but we have defined our limit from 1 to k here instead of r to 0, okay? So dividing this by 2k, 2 raised to the k, so we have 1 over 2k plus this summation function here, summation. And also we can use the result of, we know this in integral, right? That sine x over x from 0 to infinity would give us pi over 2. And therefore we can transform our integral to the following. So this sine to the kx over x would be sine 2rx over x dx 
from 0 to infinity. And then 1 to the 2k is this part here, right? Plus the x, which is our denominator on the original integral. So we already transformed this in terms of summation process, okay? So what's the next thing? Um, sine x over x is phi over 2. So it, that would still remain even if you have this variable r here. So this whole integral would become now phi over 2 here, right? Here on the next page. And then we still have 1 to the k and then the summation of this combination. So if we combine 2, 2 to the k plus 2, so that's 2 to the k plus 1 here, and we multiply 1 times pi, which is this, and then we still have this summation. So if we evaluate this summation, k r from 1 to k, uh, this would give us 2 to the k minus 1 here. This part here. So uh, since we start at 1, so that's that would remain that because 1 is actually equal to 2 to the 0 when we evaluate this, right? So since this part here is starting with zero, so that's two to the K. If we start at one, so we need to subtract that uh, constant, right? To the two, two, two to the K, two, two to raise to the K. So, so this, let's distribute the factor one to the two K to the numbers in the parentheses, right? So five over two. So we left two outside and then we distribute two to the K inside. So that's phi over two, one minus one over two to the K. All right, so that's it. So this is the answer for integrating that function. Okay, so let's move to the difficult problem. So, B1 is find the area of the triangle below with the given side lengths A, B, and C. So A is equal to the Euler fee function of 3080. B is equal to 1092B equivalent to 213 mod of 2295. And then C is equal to LCM of 8316 comma 10,920 all over 3080. So First, let's solve the A, which is the Euler P function. So 3080 can be expressed as 2 to the third times 5 times 7 times 11. So that means we can distribute the P function, P 2 to the third, P of 5, P of 7, and P of 11. So this is equivalent to P n minus 1, P minus 1. So in, in 2 to the third, our n is 3. So P to the n minus 1, so 3 minus 1 is 2. So we have the exponent of 2 here, and then our P is 2, right? P is this argument. Uh, I mean the base, sorry. And so 2 minus 1, and then for P to the P of 5, so our actually it's 1 minus 1, so that's 5 to the 0. And then since it's our base is 5 minus 1, same thing with 7. We have an exponent of 1. So 1 minus 1 would be 0. 7 minus 1. Same thing with 11. We have an exponent of 1. So 1 minus 1 would have an exponent here of 0. Quantity 11 minus 1. So if you multiply this, it will result to A equals to 960. So... We have side A already, so let's try to solve what's the next side B. So this equation here. So next, finding the value of side B of the triangle by solving the congruence equation. So 1092B is equivalent to 213 mod 2295. So we can use the Euclidean algorithm 
by solving the GCD of 1092 and 2295. Okay, so we're going to write this 2295 of the left, on the left-hand side of the equation. And we'll think the multiples of 2295 in terms of 1092. And we find out that there would be 2 times 1092 plus 1111 to have 2295. So there is a pattern. So whatever you used here, so that will be your left, uh, the value of your left-hand side of the next equation. And 111 can be used here. So we found out that 9 times 111 plus 93 would be equal to 1092. So again, 93 would be used on the third equation. And we found out that 1 times 93 plus 18 is equal to 111. Again, for 93, we find we found out that 5 times 18 plus 3 would give us 93 here. And then last is 18 equals to 6 times 3 plus 0. So there's no remainder, right? So therefore, 1092 comma 2295 is equal to 3. So if we divide 213 by 3, the remainder is 0, right? So there's no remainder. So it's divisible by 3. This means equation will have three equations. So now let's divide the equation and the modulus M 2295 by three. So our original equation is 1092 equivalence of uh, 230 modular 2295. So we have 364 and then the 71 and then the 765 here. Okay, so since 364 and 765 are relatively prime, we divide again by the GCD of 1092 and 2295, which is equal to 3. So, and thus has the unique solution modulo 765. So to solve by first finding the solution of the equation, let us first, uh, Let's find first the GCD of 364 here in 765 using to get the linear combination of 364x plus 765y equals 1, right? So similar to what we did in the Euclidean algorithm. So the first number on the left would be your 765, right? And that's, uh, we found out that that is 2 times 364 plus 37. So next would be 364 and multiple of 37 times 9 plus 31. So continue doing this. The last equation would be 6. 6 times 1 without any remainder, right? So looking at the first quotient, 1, 2, 3, 4. So if we line it up here, 1, 2, 3, 4 here. Uh, it tells us there's a linear combination of 31 and 6, right? So here is equation 4. 1 is equal to 31 minus 5 times 6. So what we can do is let's substitute equation 3 to equation 4. So equation 3, equation 4. So we will have equation 5. So 1 times 37 minus 5 times the quantity of uh, 37 minus 131, which is this. So we have 6, quantity 31, minus 5, quantity 37. Okay. Now we use equation 2 to replace 31 in equation 5. So what is equation 2 since it's equal to 31 here, right? So we just substitute 6 times 364 times 9. 37, which is this uh, constant here, minus 5 times 37. So we got, so simplifying that expression, we will have 6 times 364 minus 5 times, uh, 59 times 37. So last, so now we use the relation. So let's substitute equation 1 here. Since we have 37 in equation 6, right? So we're going to replace 37 by this relationship here. Okay, and we will get as our final answer is 
is equal to 1. That's equation 7 equals 124 times 364 minus 59 times 765. So therefore, our x is 124 and our y, that's our linear combination, negative 159. This means x is equals 124 is a unique solution of the equation. 364b equivalence to 1 module law of 765, right? So multiplying the solution by 124, x equals 124 by 71. So we multiply each by 71. So that's 884. And then is equal to 389 uh, modulo 765. So we have this. <clears throat> this is a unique solution of our original equation 364 equivalence to 71 modulo 765 here. Right, so finally, we add the, the new modulus, which is 765, to the, solu to the solution B sub 1, which is equal to 389. Two times to obtain the other solution of the given equation. So B2 would be 389 plus 765, so that's equivalent to 1154, and then B3 is 1154 times plus 765, which is 1919. So these are our three solution for B. We have 389, right? And then B2 is 1154, and then B3 is 119. So those are the solution of our original congruence, congruence equation here, right? So we have already solved A and then the three solutions for B. Now the last part of the triangle is C, right? So now solving the value of side C using the formula for finding the LCM of A and B we have. So this is the formula LCM of A and B is equal to the absolute value of A times B over the GCD of A comma B. So this is just a product rule in the numerator and then let's Take again the GCD of A316 and 1092, similar to what we did earlier. So the second number would be on the left-hand side. And the first number inside the parentheses would be uh, on the right-hand side. So we found out that this is 1 times A316 plus 2604. And then whatever we used here would be the number on the left-hand side of the equation. And then we find out the factor of that in terms of 62604 <clears throat> until we reach a value that has no remainder here. So the zero means there's no remainder. So it's exactly six times 84 is equal to 504. Therefore, our GCD for 816 comma 10, 920 is 84 here. So substituting in our equation, so that's our denominator here we will have 100, uh, what's this? 1, 000, 1, 0.81, 0.80 divided by, so that's our LCM. That's 1,081,080 divided by 30,80, right? That's the, if you look at the original triangle, that's our values there. And we have C as equal to 351. So now we have the values of A, B, and C. But again, we have to satisfy the triangular triangle inequality before we can compute our area. So let's test since we have three values of B. So B sub 1, B sub 2, and B sub 3. And of course, A and C would uh, is 960 and C would be 351. So from this table, uh, we can see at B sub 1, it, it doesn't satisfy when B plus C is greater than A. And in, in case 3, when it doesn't satisfy, is A plus C is greater than B, which is, look at the second row here, it's in red. 
the only case that it will satisfy all these three conditions for a triangle inequality is when B sub 2 is equal to 1, 1, 5, 4. So now we have the values of A equals 960, B1154, and C equals 351. So by using Hero's formula, so we'll follow K is square root of S, quantity S minus A, quantity S minus B, and quantity S minus C. So A, B, and C, we already know this. So our S would be one half of quantity A plus B plus C, which is 1, 2, 3, 2.5. So simply substitute that in our equation of Hero's formula. We will have an area of 152,448.34 square units. Okay, that's for uh, D1. So let's go now to D2. So this is a statistics problem. So Hunter observed seven observations from a Pareto distributed population with minimum possible value three. So the observations are three, four, five, 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 seven, and eight. So uh, it is required that we express it in likelihood function and the log likelihood. So what is the parameter value that maximizes the likelihood of observing the particular sample three, four, five, five, five? seven and eight so first is the the probability density function of a Pareto distribution is this f of x is alpha times uh, x alpha and m divided by x exponent alpha plus one so the first uh, condition is when x is greater than or equal to x sub m and it's zero when x is it's less than x of m. So expressing this would be the product of when x is x greater than m, starting from i1 to n, right? So this is the first um, answer. Now to get the log likelihood, we will take the natural log of both sides. So l ln of l times ln of this product uh, notation so by expanding them so L would be equal to N times ln of alpha right plus N times alpha times ln of x sub m so we brought down alpha right and then divide meaning it's minus in ln so A alpha plus 1 ln of uh, the product of x sub i, which is this part here. So we take out x sub i plus 1. That's why we have a 1 here, right? So and then uh, simplifying this, so uh, we will see that this product notation would give us x sub 1 times x sub 2 times x sub 3. Since it's up to n here, that's the limit from i to 1. So we'd have x x sub n here. So, so we can write it as a summation um, notation here. So that would be the ln of x sub i, where i is from 1 to n, right? And we just merely copy the first two terms, which is n times l, ln of alpha plus n times alpha times ln of x sub m. So this is our, our log likelihood function. So for number two, the question is, does that maximize the likelihood? So we need to get the derivative of partial derivative of L with respect to alpha. So that is equal to N over alpha since the derivative of L and alpha is one over alpha. So for the first term. And then for the second term, so we have alpha so that's only equal to one, right? And then for the last one, since we have alpha uh, and the one with the number one or the factor of one would be zero. So we will only have this summation times alpha 
where alpha derivative of alpha will be equal to one. So it's it's um, it's only this part that will be left. And then equate it to zero to get the maximum. And then let's solve for alpha. So we move every uh, the second term and the third term to the right hand side. So that's negative seven times ln of three. So since we have a minimum value equal to three and our n is seven, that's the number of our samples, right? And then ln of x sub i from i to 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's try to get the ln of those numbers. And we have 3.652 times negative 7.690. And then solve for alpha that will give us negative 1.733. All right. So if you need to check, if you get the maximum, let's take the second derivative of this in terms with respect to, again, to alpha, we have a negative n over alpha squared. So since it's, ne it's less than zero, therefore it's a maximum. Okay. Okay, let's go to question D3. So this is a differential equation problem. So Jake, a computer electronics designer made an RCL circuit connected in series that has a resistance of eight ohms and inductance of 0 0.08 Henry, capacitor of five times 10 to the negative four parad, and an applied alternating EMF of 300 cosine of 200 T volts. Find the expression for the current flowing through the circuit if the initial current and initial charge on the capacitor is both zero. What is the value of the current at T0 and T equals 1? So the requirement is we have to solve the general solution. And then the second is to, to find the value of the current at T0 and T equals 1. So let's draw first. Let's draw the our circuit. So this is our EMF. This is our resistance, capacitance, and inductance. So by Kirchhoff's loop law, where it states that the algebraic sum of the voltage drops in a simple closed electric circuit is zero. So eight times I for the resistance. So I would be our current times I. And then for the capacitance, that's point, for, for, so inductance, it's 0 0.08 times di over dt. And then for the capacitance, that's uh, capacitance times the Q or the yes, and then minus three times 400, 300 cosine of 200 T equals zero. So since I here is dQ over dT, so that's the rate of um, current current is the rate of charge over in terms of T here. We can differentiate equation one to eliminate Q. So of course the I dt would be the uh, differential of I and then second differential of I dt on the next term and then dQ dt which is equal to I, right? So charge yeah, derivative of charge with respect to T is equal to I. So, so let's rearrange that and we would get this equation. And of course, by substituting dQ over dT is equal to current, we will have this final equation. So it's a second order differential equation, di's second derivative of I with respect to T plus 100 di over dT plus 25,000i equals negative 750,000 sine of 200t. So the general solution will be the sum of the homogeneous solution and the particular solution. So let's solve first the homogeneous part. So solving for the roots of the characteristic equation. So we have lambda squared plus 100 lambda plus 25,000, which is the left-hand side of our equation. 
and then equate it to zero, we can solve for uh, lambda. So we know A equals one, B equals 100. Using the quadratic formula, uh, we will get this uh, complex number of negative 50 plus or minus 150i here, okay? So hence the associated homogeneous problem is I of H of T is C sub one times negative 50 T, which is the real part, cosine of 150 T, which is the imaginary part, becomes the argument of our cosine here. And then C sub two E to the negative 50 sine 150 T. So that's our equation two. Now let's solve for the particular solution using the method of undetermined coefficient. So again, let's copy the one we have in terms of the the IDT and equate it into negative 750 sine 200t. So we assume that our I sub P of T is equal to A sine of 200t plus B cosine of 200t, right? So let's take the derivative of our equation four. So di sub T over dt would be 200A cosine 200t minus 200B sine 200t. And then let's take again the derivative of equation five, which is the second derivative of equation four. And we have negative 40,000A sine 200t minus 40,000B cosine of 200t, okay? So let's substitute this equation four, five, and six to our equation number three, which is this, right? So, and then let's rearrange. We will get negative 65,000A minus 20,000B bracket sine two, two, sin of 200T plus negative 65,000B plus 20,000A bracket cosine 200T is equal to negative 750,000 sine 200 of T. So let's now do equating the coefficient. So we know that the one with sine 200T should have a constant or right-hand side of negative 750,000. So this part here should be equal to this. So that's our equation seven here. And we simplify it. So we have negative 13A minus 4B equals negative 150, okay? And then the, since we have no cosine 200T on the right-hand side of the equation, so we equate it to zero. So negative 65,000B plus 20,000A is equal to zero here. So we have equation eight, which is 4A equals 13b. So by solving simultaneously equation 7 and 8, we got the value of b as 20 over 37 and the value of a as 390 over 37. So going back to equation 4, which are a particular solution, right? Where is that equation? What equation is that? Equation 4 here. So we need, since we already know A and B, the values of A, we just substitute it. So we have I, P, I sub P of T is equal to 390 over 37. Sine of 200T plus 120 over 37 cosine of 200T. So that's our equation nine. So now the general solution would be our homogeneous plus the particular. So we just add it here and we form equation 10, right? So we still have a variable here of C1 and C sub 2. So now we need to apply the initial condition of initial current. So current at time zero is zero and the initial charge Q sub zero, zero is also zero. So again, substituting this di, so getting the derivative of this with respect to T at time zero, we get that di dt at at t equals zero is this 3750 here, which is our equation 11. Now let's I, um, apply the first condition, uh, i sub zero equals zero in equation 10. So we have 
we can solve i sub 0 equals c sub 1, c sub 2 times 1 times 0 plus 390 over 37 times 0 plus 120 times 37 times 1 equals 0. And we will be able to solve c sub 1. So the next thing to solve is c sub 2, right? So substituting the value of c sub 1 in equation 12, which is this. And differentiating i of t again with respect to t. So after we substitute the value here, let's, substitute, let's take the der derivative of the i dt, which is this long equation here. And then let's apply equation 11. So since we already know the i dt is 370, 50 at t equals 0. So we will be able to solve c sub 2 here, which is equal to 365 over 37. So therefore, the general solution with the give with the solve c1, c2 is i of t 1 over 20, negative 120 over 37 e to the negative 50 t cosine of 150 t plus 365 over 37 e to the negative 50 t sine 150 t plus 390 over 37 times sine 200 t plus 1 over 20, 120 over 37 cosine 200 t. So now let's solve current at t zero. So of course i of zero is zero, that's already given. And then current at t sub one, Substituting at our general solution, we solve that it's negative 7.624496 ampere. So A means ampere, okay? So if you have any questions, please write down at the comment section or if you have any other method in solving this uh, problem, please comment again to our, um, at the comment section in our Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram accounts. Okay, so let's go now to problem number four, difficult. So let's determine polynomial determine polynomials m of a, b, c, d, and n of a, b, c, d with real coefficients such that a, b plus c plus d squared minus quantity a squared minus 2c, quantity b squared minus 2d has, is equivalent to m of a of b, c, d squared minus a squared minus 2c, n of a, b, c, d squared. Okay, so uh, requirement is what are the polynomials for m? So that's two points and the polynomials of n's, n. So we know that polynomial M has A, B, C, D in its form and same thing with N, which is A, B, C, D in its form. So first thing we do is, of course, uh, we're looking a solution in the form of A, B plus A for M and N, B plus B. Okay, so... A, B, and B plus capital B. So where A and B are polynomials in A, B, and C, right? So we know that A, <coughs> A, A, B are polynomials A, B, and C. By plugging in this equation to equation one, so plugging in this, so A plus B plus C plus D squared minus a squared so the only thing that will change is on the right side right so this is the square so a b plus a is this part here which we squared and then same thing with a squared minus 2c and then the n would be the square of this value here so expanding this we would get uh, the second line which is this so we're going to expand and uh, multiply all the variables. So once we're done with it, we can see that we can cancel out on the left. Since we have a squared, b squared, 
on the left hand side and we have on the right hand side of the equation a squared b squared so we can cancel that out that's the first one we can see and then the second one is minus a squared b squared and also we have a minus a squared b squared so that's the second cancellation we can do and then the third is we have plus 2b squared c and also 2 plus b squared c 2b squared c on the right hand side so we can cancel out so simplifying this we have uh, c minus d squared so factoring this part here and then 2a squared d and then 2a quantity of c plus d and then the small b here is equivalent to so we again we arrange this a squared minus quantity of a squared minus 2c b squared and then plus so the key here is you have to combine all the terms which is a common factor to be able to solve uh, this this equivalent equation so and then two times a capital a minus quantity a squared minus 2c times b and then multiply by smaller b so the next step is we can actually equate coefficients so what can you see the a squared this part here is actually equal to the first part right and then the second term on the right hand side would be equal to the second term on the left hand side right so which is b okay this one here since this is 2a so we cancel out 2 so we left with a quantity c plus d in equation 3 here so and then from equation 3 we can solve for capital a which is a squared minus 2c uh, and then the capital b plus a quantity c plus d all over a that's equation 4 so now let's substitute equation 4 in equation 2 so we have this equation here and let's expand this so when we expand again we can do some cancellation so a to the fourth b squared is cancelled out because we have another a, a to the fourth b squared here on the left hand side but it's negative so that's zero and then the second we can cancel out a squared c squared which is on the right hand side so that is also cancelled out and then a squared d squared which is also uh, appearing on the right hand side so that's also cancelled out and then we can manipulate this so combining like terms and factoring out so we have this line here of b squared 2c quantity 2c minus a squared plus b so the key here is that we should be able to combine terms that has a similar uh, quantity that can be canceled out later. So uh, this is what I did. I was able to factor out with a common factor of quantity 2c minus a squared. Look at the, so on the first term, I have that second term i have also that one and on the right hand side so that means i can cancel it out right so from the three terms here so what is left is 2cb squared minus 2ab quantity c plus d equals negative 2a squared d so this is a quadratic polynomial and i use quadratic formula to solve for the value b right so since we have b squared capital b and we will be able to solve that b has of course two solution since degree two right formula so the first solution is a b is equal to a and the other solution for b is that a d over c okay 
So what I noted here is discarding the second solution we, since we're solving for polynomials of x and y, hence we have, so we discard a, d over c and we only use a, right? b equals to a. So we have for a, uh, what's our, we solve it here, right? In equation four and we substitute the value of b equals a. So we, that's the only b that appears in equation four. So here is that b and we substitute it by a, which we solved here. So we got a equals a squared minus cd plus d. And of course we chose b, of b is equal to a, right? So therefore, from the following equations, we can plug in the values of a and b. So a, b plus a, so that is a, b plus a squared minus c plus d. And then for n, a, b, c, d is b plus capital B is b plus a, or it's also equal to a plus b. So that's our answer for number, difficult problem number four. So that is four points, right? Yes, if you answer this, you got four points for this. So let's go to question number five. So the question is, find the coefficient of x to the 60 uh, in the following polynomial. So we're going to solve what is the coefficient of x to the 60 from this polynomial. So. So 1 plus x plus 2 times 1 plus x squared <clears throat> plus 3, 1 plus x to the third power plus up to 1,000 times 1 plus x to the 1,000 power. So we are going to solve x to the 60. So first, let's represent this polynomial by m of x, right, which is this. And then we can have the form 1 plus x mx minus mx so so 1 plus x so uh, essentially we're multiplying all of this polynomial by 1 plus x and then we subtract it again by m of x which is also this full polynomial here which is this bracket here and then if we, we notice we can actually get um, 1,000 plus x to the 1,000 and to the, which is this part here. And because the rest would actually be um, a difference, right? If you notice the first term, 1 plus x squared minus 1, 2 of 1 minus x squared. So that's negative, right? And then for the third, same thing. Third power, we have 2 minus 3. So that's 1 plus x, x to the third power. And we, of course, the first term would be this negative here, right? So that would uh, go up to 1 plus x uh, to the 100 power, right? And to the 1,000 power, sorry, not, not to the 100. So the only uh, we have taken out from this bracket here of negative polynomial would be this value because there is no, there would be no same uh, equation, uh, exponent for, for 1 plus x to the 1,001. So we put it here in front and the rest could be subtracted from m of x. So now it can be observed that the terms inside the bracket is a geometric series. So if you look at this, this would be the first term, second term, and we can take the ratio of that a sub two over a sub one, which is one plus x squared over one plus x. So that's one plus x. If you're gonna take four, over the third series, we would also be getting this, right? Also, the 1,000 to the 999, we would also be getting this, 
when we divide that or taking the ratio. So we can actually simply get the sum of this geometric series here, which is the equation is S sub N, E sub N R minus E sub one over all over R minus one. So S of 1000, because there are 1000 terms, we will get S of 1000 is one plus X to the 1000, one minus one plus X all over X. So our polynomial will have the form. So this, first term here uh, rate uh, with the exponent of 1001 is our first term here right and the sum that we just recently solved for s sub 1001 is the second term here in the negative part okay so we can now see that if we factor out m of x in the left hand side, we will have one plus X minus one. So essentially that is M of X bracket X, right? Which is equivalent to our right hand side. So that M of X is actually divided by, so the first, of course, the first term would be divided by X. Since we have an X here, if we divide it by X, that would be X squared. Okay, so if we expand 1 plus x to the 1001, so this would be equivalent to r to the 0 summation, summation of CR to 1001 times 1 to the 1001 x to the 1001 minus r. So this is combination of 1001 taken r at a time from r equals 0 to 1001. So when we simplify this, since 1 to the 1001 is still 1, right? So essentially, we have x to the 1001 minus r and then the combination part, right? So when you expand this, so this will be x to the 1001 plus 1001 x to the 1000 up to uh, 1001 x plus 1, right? So... Look at the last uh, bar expression or last variable when the last limit is substituted. So 1001 times 1001 is zero. So X to the zero is simply equal to one. So which is this part here, right? So of course we will not solve from zero to 1001. We're just getting the first two parts and the last three parts. So we can see the, the pattern, okay? So since we already solved 1 plus x to the 1001, let's substitute it here. So in our equation, so the whole of this times 1000, right, on the first term. And then on the second term, that's the whole of this minus 1 plus x, which is the second term, right? So Therefore, x60 will have a coefficient at r equals 61, right? On the first expansion here, because if we divide x to the 61 over x because of this denominator here, then we will have x to the 60, which is, which is exactly the x that we're looking for. And then on the second term, our r should be 62, right? So 62 divided by x squared to be able to get x to the 60. So by calculating here, so we know that at r is 61, we have 1,000, right? Which is this part times the combination of 1,001 taken at 61 r at a time. So that this is the formula. And then on the second um, term, since this is negative, we just subtract it. So 1001 divided by 62 factorial times 1001 minus 62. So simplifying this, we would get 61,060 times 1000 factorial over 62 factorial over 940 factorial. So if you're able to solve this, again, you will get uh, four points. So that's it already. So I think we're over time.
sorry for that so there you go so to so to those who did not make it for the elimination round two you can still register for the last two elimination rounds three and four and of course thank you for watching us today at math agility live if you have any question please write it down in the comment section or you can send us a chat in our inbox in our facebook account so see you next thursday so the topic will be about bitcoin technical trading so our speaker will talk about uh, the quantitative and qualitative uh, ideas behind Bitcoin and some of the glimpse of what kind of mathematics is used by the, our researcher, finance researcher from Germany. Okay, so again, um, thank you to... I'm not thank you, but congratulations to... Chris Norman Algo, Renis Slim, Icy Lance Bautista, Kenneth Bean Sereno, and Celio, Shello Mia Balilia, Jeric Maliari, and Joshua Gallo, and then Jikim Cleopas Bukabal. So see you on the semifinal round. So hope you have learned from me today and God bless everyone and stay safe.